please pray with me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. In the coming days, many of you will embark on lengthy road trips. As grown-ups, these can be a lot of fun. But as a child, I remember I dreaded long trips in the car. I can still recall the pinch of a poorly made seat belt, the nauseating aroma of cheap upholstery baking in the sun, windows too high for a child to see out of, the fact that you were hungry and thirsty and couldn't do anything about it. And when I asked that well-known child's question, how much longer? Why is it taking so long this time? I was sometimes met with a particularly cruel response. We're taking the scenic route. <laughs> the scenic route? <laughs> to a child, all the scenic route meant was that instead of the highway, we had opted for windy country roads, read car sick, <laughs> and that it would take twice as long to actually get to grandma's house. We had a passage from the book of Exodus, and I would suggest that one way of understanding Exodus through Deuteronomy is as a record of one of the worst car trips of all time. <laughs> To keep the passage brief, I left out what comes right before and what comes right after. So we get sort of an uplifting, God's going to give bread and you're going to see the glory of the Lord. What comes right before and right after is everyone is grumbling. Before the Israelites have even gotten out of, across the Red Sea, they see Pharaoh's armies, get scared, and say, we should have just died in Egypt. As soon as they get across the Red Sea, they say they're thirsty, they get water, they say they're hungry, they get food. Then they say the, the, the food, the bread doesn't taste that good, they want meat. At this point, and I mean no dishonor to the Lord, but the portrait of God looks almost like the parent at end of tether on said road trip, <laughs> where God says, we want meat. It was better for us in Egypt. I'll give you meat. <laughs> You'll have meat, not one day, not two, not five, not 20, but a month until it comes out of your nostrils. <laughs> That's numbers 11. <laughs> At which point Moses says, I want to die. <laughs> now, I, I have not witnessed, in my nine years here, I have not witnessed this firsthand, but I've heard reports that there has even been grumbling and murmuring here. <laughs> uh, that second and third hand, I've heard someone complained that Bible content exams were a ridiculous idea. <laughs> that they had no idea why they were being asked to learn theologians whose names they couldn't pronounce. And even when there weren't complaints from students, there have been rumors that perhaps some families were grumbling and murmuring. We did everything right with Jenny. The Miller's daughter is already a partner at the law firm. <laughs> Jenny still hasn't gotten an adequate paying job. We should never have let her go to Sunday school. If we come back to our story from Exodus, it has sometimes occurred to me that this is such an unsavory tale of misadventure born with bad humor and ill will that you'd think it was written by the Egyptians or the Philistines, taunting the Israelites and their God. It's easy to forget that this is the Israelites' version of the story. 
Moses is the one summing it up and saying, then we went the wrong way. We went south instead of north. We were in the desert, no food again. Scorpions, uh, (laughs) you grumbled against me, I grumbled against God, and then we did it some more. (laughs) That's an uncommon way to say, this is why we count ourselves so blessed to be the chosen ones (laughs) who worship the one true, mighty, and gracious God. We could well imagine that in Deuteronomy, when Moses takes the long view back, as many of you are doing now, that Moses could say, I'm disappointed, God. Our brilliant escape from Egypt was subsequently overshadowed by four decades of betrayal, failure, and disaster. The reason Moses doesn't say that is that he doesn't think God was trying to get the Israelites from point A to point B in the quickest possible fashion. Rather, Moses says, in effect, God was taking us by the scenic route. (laughs) God took us this way because it was the only way that we could see the glory of the Lord. Two quotations from Deuteronomy. God took us the long way these 40 years to humble us, to let us hunger and then defeat us so that we would understand that we don't live by bread alone. God led us through a terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with fiery scorpions, fiery serpents and scorpions, and God gave us water and food to humble us and in the end to do us good. As is often the case, if you turn to a New Testament passage, having dwelt a bit on the Old Testament passage, things fall quickly into focus. In Luke 9, Jesus sends his disciples out on something of a mini exodus. They're sent out without standard provisions, no purse, no staff for support or protection, not even enough clothing for warmth. Now surely, given what we know about these disciples, there were some doubts, some fears, probably a bit of grumbling. Would it have made it impossible to proclaim the gospel if we had had a second tunic? (laughs) You can also imagine a tremendous sense of fear, right? This is their first time. Every time Jesus talks about the kingdom, he gets difficult counter questions. What will resurrection be like? Well, how does this kingdom intersect with the kingdom of Caesar? And Jesus always has fantastic, clever, learned, witty repartee. (laughs) What was it like for them without him winning every battle as they go to the village and say, all right, kingdom of God is drawn near. We we tried it. It wasn't received. (laughs) What was it like without Jesus to put hands on a fierce demoniac and say, in the name of Jesus, I can't. What did they think was going to happen? <laughs> Remarkably, their little mission trip, their little travel seminar, <laughs> seems to have gone exceedingly well. They come back and tell Jesus what happened. And you know this feeling, hands still shaking on the, on the headiness of, ex, of, of success, enthusiasm, adrenaline, euphoria, which are quickly followed by the crash of exhaustion. And so, Jesus takes them off, as the good shepherd, to a quiet place. The pesky crowds follow along anyway, and Jesus ministers to them, teaches them, heals them. But the disciples say, Jesus, you brought us to a quiet place. It's time for a little me time. Send the crowds away. And Jesus doesn't say, you know what, this has been a little much for you. You did well. You're beat, you're scared, you're exhausted. Let's take a break. What does he say? He says, you give them something to eat. And if we think about the passage in Exodus, where the point of being in the wilderness and desperate was to see the glory of the Lord, it's interesting to think about the very next passage in Luke. You know what happens. There's another feeding in the wilderness, bread from heaven. 
but with human mediators providing that bread, participating in the miracle. Jesus then says, who do people say that I am? The crowds have been fed and healed and taught, but they don't know. The disciples know. Why do they know who Jesus is when the others don't? This is not one of the things he taught them when alone. He has not told them. It's because they were the ones who went out without enough. They were the ones who felt his power flow through them, who became his hands and feet as the body of Christ. It was only they who knew who Christ was. You all, in various ways, have already taken brave and scary steps. Coming to YDS, and in many of your cases, things you did before you came here, stories are remarkable that I hear from students about the sort of work you've already done, and your courage, your faith, your willingness to live in deprivation. What's tempting now is to say, wow, it's been a bumpy ride, that was rough, but we graduated, we made it. I'm ready for a good pulpit and an appreciative congregation. I'm ready for a teaching position or a cozy position in a doctoral program. But there's no reason to believe that things are about to get easier. <laughs> because the stories we read today are the track record of the God you're following. Next year, I don't wish this on anyone, but one of you will be assistant minister of such and such in a church with a megalomaniacal priest. <laughs> and you will rebuild the youth program, and she will take the credit. <laughs> and you'll have to decide, what do I do now? Is it time, time to wise up and get some me? Or do I keep feeding? Do I keep giving? One of you will be in a doctoral program, and you'll share your teaching plan with a fellow TA, and it'll go brilliantly, so brilliantly, that he wins the teaching prize. And you'll have to decide, do I love my students, or do I want accolades? I think you steal yourselves for these moments by reflecting on how God has brought us this far, right? So Moses says, in Deuteronomy, folks, it was a rough 40 years, I know. But did the clothes on your back wear out? Did your feet swell? And Jesus, at the end of his ministry, when he comes to the hardest lesson of all, I'm about to die. You'll have to follow. He goes back to this episode. He says, I wasn't messing with you. He says, when I sent you out without a purse and a bag or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, not a thing. When we're children in the backseat of the car, we grumble. We don't know why the road is so long. We don't know what a scenic route means. It's time to put aside childish ways, and it's time to quit grumbling about the long road. We have no promise that the way will be straight or smooth henceforth. We do have a promise that God will travel with us, will provide for us, and that God is taking us on this journey because God longs to do us good and to let us see the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen.